this is Mr. Coates, and this is Apes Lecture number 53 on water pollution. Water pollution is a, a huge concern worldwide. Uh, it's not just a problem in developing countries like you see here. This is uh, in Korea somewhere, uh, but you can see all this trash floating around in the water here, all this debris. It's all washed up on the shore here. These people fish. Uh, they eat the fish that come out of this area. They also swim and bathe in this, and then you see all their huts and things are like over top of the water, and their restrooms are probably right there as well, and they probably defecate right in the same water in which they fish. So it's not a very good scenario for those developing countries in water quality. But we even have the problem here in the United States. This picture over here shows what we call the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. And this is an area at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico that has absolutely no dissolved oxygen whatsoever, or very low level. The, the bottom sediments have absolutely no oxygen whatsoever there. And so we believe that that is mostly due from all the pollution coming from the Midwest, where we are uh, doing all kinds of farming. All right, I seem to have a visitor. This is Buddy. Buddy, do you want to say hi to everybody? Come here, Buddy. So Buddy is one of the two dogs. All right, so when we talk about water quality, we want to make sure that we know the difference between a point source pollutant versus a non-point source pollutant. Point source pollutants are those pollutants that are I easily identify as to where the cause or where the source is. These are also very easily to, to clean up. Usually it's a pipe draining from a factory or a power plant or some other single entity that uh, is uh, re discharging whatever is coming out of the pipe. And so this is a point source pollution. Now, you have other types of pollutants, which are called non-point source pollutants, and these come from very diffuse sources, diffuse or large areas of land where there isn't one single major source entity. And so runoff is a good example of a non-point source, and usually it's the type of pollution that's very difficult to clean up. In this picture here, this is a blowout of a dike for a coal ash pond that happened in Virginia back in 2015. And uh, you can see the coal ash kind of blew out the dike right in this area and then entered a local river there in Virginia and polluted the entire river with this coal ash. This was a point source pollutant because you knew exactly where it was coming from. This coal ash has high levels of lead and possibly mercury and the entire river was basically poisoned because of this blowout. And the company that was responsible is now in the process of cleaning all this up, but we're all responsible for types of water pollution, and the main type, uh, as I said, is non-point source. So anytime we do something in our yards, we spray pesticides or we put down fertilizer, then uh, next time it rains really hard, then all that stuff gets in the nearest water body. And so we all have a part to play when it comes to cleaning up water quality. All right, the main sources of water pollution in the world, uh, number one is agriculture. So agriculture is number one because of all these different things. Uh, soil erosion, number number one, whenever we till up the soil, we always introduce all kinds of pollutants that can get into the water via uh, runoff and erosion. Fertilizers, ever since the first Green Revolution, we started using synthetic fertilizers and th synthetic pesticides to spray on our crops to get higher yields. Well, all the time, those are getting into our water bodies through runoff. And then the last one here is livestock waste. Livestock waste occurs when we have large numbers of livestock in a small amount of area where their feces can run off into the nearest water body very easily. And so agriculture is the biggest source of water pollution in the world. After that, it's mostly industry and mining. Industry and mining, they use water for cooling, mostly for solvent. Uh, mining mostly comes from acid mine drainage. So when you have a mine, a lot of the water that gets in the mine starts to dissolve some of the rock in these areas, which can be acidic and that can drain into the nearest water body. So acid mine drainage. That's what you see in this picture right here is uh, water coming from a mining area and it has all this orange coloration to it. In developing countries, sometimes it's uh, cyanide because of gold mining uses cyanide. So it's not very good. And then a lot of our water pollution is mostly for runoff. And that's what this picture shows over here. Uh, we have a lot of impervious surfaces. These are surfaces that don't allow water to sink in to the ground where it would naturally get filtered. So we have concrete and asphalt parking lots where the pollutants can run off into the nearest drain. Now in uh, many states these drains go to the nearest water body. Some of them go to the sanitary sewer but most of them actually go to the water body themselves. But you can see this real big plume here of uh, oil 
that is actually draining right into this drain and eventually that'll affect the water body wherever this drains to. Unfortunately people see this going to a drain and a lot of people think it's going to get cleaned up and most people it's just out of sight out of mind at that point but it does cause a problem. One of the best indicators of water quality is fecal col coliforms and fecal coliforms mostly come from human and animal waste. Uh, so fecal coliform pollution is also a big concern when it comes to monitoring water quality. High levels al always indicate human pollution and this is mostly from sewage. Uh, and usually in Florida you see signs like this put out by the local governments to tell you not to swim. Uh, certain diseases can be caused by this type of pollution, um, cholera, uh, dysentery, and then typhoid fever. So this is a auger plate here with uh, bacterial, coliform bacterial colonies growing on it. Thanks to the Clean Water Act, every state in the country has a set limit as to how much coliform bacteria can be in water. And so every time the levels get too high, a sign like this goes up near that water body and that water body is closed for anybody uh, swimming in it or catching fish or things like that. Now another major indicator of water quality is dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is amount of dissolved O2, the molecule oxygen, in the water. That's separate from the actual oxygen in the water molecule, the H2O molecule. So dissolved oxygen is this, the same oxygen that all the aquatic organisms breathe. It's a major water quality indicator because usually pollution from things like sewage or other organics reduces the oxygen. As uh, organisms like bacteria and fungi start to break down those organic waste, they start using oxygen through normal cellular respiration. Their oxygen use is then is called BOD, and that stands for biochemical oxygen demand. And so it's the amount of oxygen needed by those bacteria or those fungi to break down organic waste. And you have to realize that dissolved oxygen and BOD are inversely related. So if you have a high dissolved oxygen, that means you probably have a low BOD. And if you have a high BOD, chances are you're going to have low oxygen level. DO is a good water uh, quality indicator. So when we look at DO in parts per million, also known as milligrams per liter, at 20 degrees Celsius, 8 to 9 or even above that, is a good level for dissolved oxygen. We start getting to slightly polluted once we get below I8. We get uh, below 6.7 is moderately polluted. We start getting down here into this 4.5. We start losing fish at this point. This is way too low to support fish, and this is way, way too low to support just about any kind of life whatsoever. And so we have lots of pollution if we get dissolved oxygen levels uh, below 4 parts per million. Now when we look at oxygen in a stream, the one way that we can tell where the pollution is coming from is to look at the oxygen levels as we move up and down the stream. So we have uh, the pollution source right here coming into the stream and it's polluting the water down through this direction and the stream is going this direction. And so what we see is that if we measure dissolved oxygen and we measure biochemical oxygen demand, we see that dissolved oxygen is pretty high at the beginning here before the pollution enters in. And then once this pollution enters in, the bacteria start breaking it down and so they start to use the oxygen the oxygen then sags really low here. And then as the stream moves on further and further, and the bacteria and the fungi have broken down most of that waste, the oxygen starts to rebound. At that same time, BOD is very low at the beginning, and then it creeps way up uh, when the pollution enters the stream, and then slowly starts to decrease as the bacteria and fungi break down those wastes. This is called the oxygen sag curve, and you see that sag right here. And it's a very easy way to find out where the pollution's coming from. So if you're a biologist and you take oxygen here, you take oxygen here, 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 you can basically pinpoint, even if you can't see this pipe right here, you can pinpoint whereabouts in the stream the uh, organic waste is coming into and then address that problem. And so oxygen sag curve is very important in cleaning up water pollution in stream. Now why is the oxygen sag curve important? It's because of the range of tolerance. Every organism has a certain range of tolerance for just about every water quality parameter. This uh, allows us to, to look and see that if we have low dissolved oxygen in places, there are going to be some certain fish species we don't have. For example, we won't have trout. We won't have bass. Some of the amphibians won't be around. We won't have a diverse insect larvae population or community. And so if we get low oxygen, those generalist species, generalists like carp and worms and bacteria films, those are going to be present in those polluted waters 
more than these will be up here. Usually a generalist has a very wide range of tolerance where a specialist has a very narrow range of tolerance for these things. Now this picture here shows range of tolerance for temperature, but you can say the same thing about dissolved oxygen. There's a range of tolerance for dissolved oxygen as well. The range of tolerance is uh, a key when it comes to the sag curve. Once you get outside that sag curve, then the range of tolerance for dissolved oxygen goes back up and you can start seeing some of those more important species like trout and bass. One other type of pollution that occurs that actually affects the oxygen is thermal pollution. Thermal pollution exists when you have hot water being discharged from a local power plant uh, or some kind of industry into surface water. So in this picture here we have a some kind of plant, power plant right here that's discharging its cooling water into the nearest surface water here and the cooling water is used to cool the power plant also to create steam and so this water when it's released is very very warm it creates this large plume of hot water in this water body and this is pretty large compared to the size of uh, the industry there so the hot water can affect the surface waters for quite a ways away also depending on how far the currents take it now the problem with high temperatures is that warmer water holds less oxygen the warmer your water, and if you see this graph right here, uh, as our temperature goes up here, our oxygen goes down. So the warmer the water is, the less dissolved gases it can carry, and dissolved oxygen is a dissolved gas. We want to keep our water temperature in a range where it can hang on to oxygen if it's present. And by adding thermal pollution to these areas, we usually decrease the oxygen level significantly to where we can't support life in the immediate area. Now, once we get past that immediate area on here, there are some life forms that can exist. And also, depending on currents, this plume can move as well. So if you're stuck on the bottom and you're up here, like you say you're an oyster or maybe you're a coral or something, and you're stuck on the bottom and the plume changes, you could be in big trouble if this plume changes. Your dissolved oxygen could go down to where you don't survive. Well, that's all I have on uh, the water pollution side of things. We're going to talk about specific pollutants and dissolved oxygen. If you have any questions, please bring them to class.